the case of the cancellation of David Dobrik is not important because of the conflicts it has created, and it is not important because of the questions that have been raised. It's important because of the questions nobody's asking. It's important precisely for all the things that are not controversial, that are passing us by unquestioned and unchallenged. David Dobrik never had a job interview at Google. He was never hired to be a presenter at YouTube. Now, if David Dobrik had gone and given an interview and been hired by a TV station to provide commentary on current events, nobody would be surprised if today he had been fired by that TV station or by that radio station because they said, well, this was the contract we signed with him. This was the sort of image he was supposed to maintain. This was his job. Whatever the details of the case may be, I think we all understand very well the relationship of employer to employee and that if he had been hired by a TV station as a broadcaster, as a performer, as an actor, as a host, as a personality, right, he would have all the benefits of being an employee, which includes not just a regular paycheck, health care, probably union membership, maybe even a lawyer to defend his interests and conflicts of, of this type, right? And he would have disadvantages also. He would have a relationship of authority to someone who was his boss. There would be someone he answered to. There would be someone in the corporate hierarchy. There would be someone who had final cut decision on what did and didn't make it into the show when the broadcast came. Right? None of us want to question just how different the relationship is between being a YouTube personality and YouTube as a technology. Because YouTube is not a broadcaster. It's not a television station. It's not a radio station. It's not your boss. None of us showed up for an interview and were hired by YouTube. And YouTube's relationship to us is not of employer to employee. I think there is a very, very important parallel case to be considered in the legality or illegality of Uber. Uber and Lyft, these are companies that compete with taxi cab services around the world. During the years 2019 and 2020, there was a storm of controversy, especially in the state of California, about to what extent Uber and Lyft, these taxi cab-like companies that exist through the internet, through mobile phone connections, to what extent they would be forced to recognize their employees as employees, to take on the role of employer with all of its responsibilities, all of its powers, all of its advantages and disadvantages. To what extent would the people who earned money driving a taxi for this company be entitled to the benefits that for centuries taxi cab companies have provided to their drivers. Why was there this special exception for Uber and Lyft? The answer was that Uber and Lyft presented themselves not as an employer, not as a company, not as a company that owns a gold mine and then employs people as miners and takes on responsibility in case that miner gets injured, to pay for them to go to the hospital. No, 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 no. What Uber and Lyft wanted you to think was that they had developed a technology that could now exist in your life as invisibly as the word processor. Right? This is just a piece of software. This is just a piece of software that sits on your phone and allows you, as an isolated individual, to get in touch with and have a relationship with another isolated individual. You get to pay that person to drive their car and all Uber does, all the corporation does is sit back and keep a percentage because their technology facilitated the connection between you. A very profitable arrangement for the company, an arrangement in which they do not have to take any of the responsibilities, financial or otherwise, as employers, right? And 
the drivers don't have to take on the responsibility of being an employee. So if they get sick, their employer does not provide them with sick pay. They also don't have a boss they can call to make up an excuse for being sick. There is no call. Nobody is going to ask. Anyone who drives for those companies, if they decide to just stop driving for two weeks, they decide to just go on vacation, just they're sick, they stop driving their car, no questions are asked. Nobody to answer to. Nobody's going to check, are you really sick? And nobody is going to pay them a dime for the time they're spending when they're not working. Right? Year 2020 was eventful. I think what a lot of people didn't hear was how that legal and political controversy came to its conclusion in California. And it came to a conclusion with a vote. The people of California were asked to vote on a proposition, a referendum, if you will, for whether or not there should be a special exception made to the laws so that Uber and Lyft could continue in this way, employing people without legally recognizing them as their employees. And the companies involved, Uber and Lyft, said, if you don't vote for this, we're leaving California. We cannot do business. It is not affordable for us, and it's not affordable for you as consumers to actually, pardon me, take on all the responsibilities of an employer-employee relationship. The people voted. The corporations won. And so Uber and Lyft get to exist, not as an employer but just as a technology in the same sense you have a word processor, right? Now, what is the relationship of David Dobrik to YouTube? Okay. Nobody's questioning the relationship of him to his audience. My relationship to my audience is really no different than if I were a corporate employee in a broadcast company. It's surreal, but it's true. I know a lot of people probably relate to David Dobrik from audience to broadcaster the same way they would relate to someone employed by the MTV company or some other big corporate TV content creator, right? But that has nothing to do with David Dobrik's relationship to YouTube. YouTube never interviewed David Dobrik. He never was an employee. David Dobrik was for YouTube, a customer in precisely the same sense that you are a customer of your email service whenever you enter in your password and check your email. All right? now, I do not like David Dobrik. I don't just mean I dislike his content. I dislike him as a person. I dislike everything he's done with his life. When I look at the videotape evidence that created this controversy, I feel absolutely nothing but contempt for the young men who choose to live their lives this way, and I can't understand why anyone would consider it entertaining. This is the apotheosis of stupidity. Everything about it. I, I don't like the drinking. I don't like the excuse for humor involved. And no, I don't like the sexuality. I don't like the way it relates to women. I don't like the way it treats women. I don't like any of it. All right? However, there are some people in this audience who don't like me. There are some people who disapprove of my sex life. In the last seven years, I have very publicly been going through a divorce. And you can imagine, as it's taken seven years, it still isn't over yet, it's what you call a difficult divorce. My ex-wife has not made it easy for me. Do you think my YouTube channel should be canceled? Should be shut down? Because some people are offended by what they know, however imperfect, however one-sided, what they think they know about my sex life, about my divorce. What about my email account? What if one day I turn on my computer and I can't access my email account because a little window pops up and the company that owns the email service says, hey, we don't want to do business with you anymore. We think you and your sex life have a bad reputation. How would you feel if you suddenly were closed off from and cut off from your email account? You think it's a human right, but it's not. 
David Dobrik's relationship to his YouTube channel is precisely the same legally as your relationship to your email account. You are not an employee of your email account. You are the user of a piece of software. And you feel, rightly or wrongly, that you have the right to continue using that software regardless of the sordid details of your private life. Now, many decades ago, in pretty much every Western country, it became an established practice that your employer would not judge you and would not fire you for what you did in your private life and your sex life unless it somehow interfered with or involved what you did at the office or what you did at the factory. So a lot of you guys may not believe this, but there are innumerable men who are facing charges and going to court and even going to prison for sex crimes. And their employers will say, whether they work at a gold mine, digging up ore out of the ground, or <laughs> they, work, they answer telephones at a call center, no matter what your job is, where the employer says, we have a human resources manual, and whatever problem you're going through, this is your private life. It's none of our business. It didn't happen at the office. It wasn't between two employees. So you can keep coming to the gold mine, and we are not even going to ask. All right? Like, think about that, okay? Employers do not presume to judge employees the way YouTube presumes to judge its users, its broadcasters, the way YouTube presumes to silence and kick off and punish and demonetize its broadcasters. And we all know, no matter how little we sympathize with David Dobrik, and for me, it's zero. I have zero sympathy for him. I have my own biases. But we know YouTube has heard less than one side of the story. We all know how these controversies go. No matter how despicable the person is, whether it's Anissian or Jacqueline Glenn or any, or whether it's me, whether it's my story, whether it's what I've been through in the last 10 years, all right? You know the executives at YouTube are not going to hear both sides of the story. They're not going to carry out the equivalent of a criminal investigation. They are not even going to treat you as innocent until proven guilty. Their attitude is where there's smoke, there's fire, there's smoke, meaning public controversy of some kind. Therefore, put water on it, douse the fire, shut down the YouTube channel, move on. Okay? This could happen to you. And it's not just YouTube. We need to, in a really profound way, question the relationship of the creator to the almost living tools that we rely on for our creativity. All right? Books change the world. Terrible people write terrible books that have terrible consequences. Millions of people have died. Millions of people have killed each other over what's written down in black ink on white paper. And this ain't something new. All right? And people kill themselves in other ways. They buy books that are full of advice about weight loss, health care, spirituality, cleansing, how to cure your depression, how to cure your acne. People buy self-help books that ruin their lives and may even kill them. And people read books of philosophy and decide to go out and kill others. Okay, Books are dangerous. They always have been. And that's partly because some books are written by dangerous people with dangerous intentions. Do you think those people should be shut down and censored by their own word processor? Because we have the ability to do that. We have the ability for the word processor to have a little window come up. The same way David Dobrik and Anissi and all these other people had a little window come up and say, guess what? You're too edgy. You're too offensive. 
the way Mumkey Jones had his whole YouTube career disappear and evaporate. Oh, you crossed a line and there's, you don't get a day in court. We don't hear your side of the story, right? We can have the word processor shred your manuscript before you had a chance to publish it. We can have your email service close down and deprive you of the ability to speak to your publisher, to speak to your own mom and dad. For many of us, email is the only way we have to keep in contact with people. It's part of your work life. It's part of your personal life. But as a creator, as a creative writer, as a creative person, our relationship to the word processor, to the email account, to the blog, to the YouTube channel, that is not supposed to be a relationship of employer to employee. I do not work for YouTube any more than I work for my word processor or my piece of paper or my pen. These are my tools. But we are living in an era of history when, for the first time, the tools can silence the author.